Hey, what's up, Rex? How's it going, man? Yo, Kiwi. <laughs> Country roads, dude. Take me home. How you both doing? How both you guys doing? Am I making a map? No, I made a map with the help of uh, another artist. Hey, there's the other artist. And what's going on? And this is a little late night chill D&D &D thing that I want to do just because I was going to do it anyway. So I decided why not? I'll just stream it. I'm doing five. I'm glad you're doing five. Sneak, why is it 5 a.m.? <laughs> Why are you do? Why are you five a.m.? What's the map for? The map is my uh, D and D world. This is my custom D and D world. this is the map I made this looks so much better than what I did if I remember well so this is the map I made um, but I I heavily traced your map that you made to make it happen um, this is what I did this is what I did while I was recovering from surgery I did this every day for like 10 hours for like a month I was watching Star Wars. Yo, nice. Which Star Wars? Uh, so yeah, I'm just I'm just here. I'm I was going to do this anyway cuz I have a D&D &D campaign tomorrow. I'm doing a home game with a couple of my friends, so I was going to do some some campaign writing and building. I figured I would just stream it. If nobody showed up, that's fine. I was going to do this anyway. <laughs> Episodes one through three, nice. This looks awesome. Thanks, Anne. Or this looks good. Thanks, Anne. So let's see. Hey, Hawaiian guy, thank you so much for the host. How are you doing today, Hawaiian guy? This isn't working. Why is this not working? sign in? I don't know why you're not letting me sign in. You guys can probably see that on stream. That's fine. Uh, Alright, I don't know why that's not working. Weird. Sneak eye as well. How would be pops? Yo, I'm pretty good, man. I'm just chilling. About to do some campaign research and writing for tomorrow even though i i have an idea of what i want to do i just need to write it uh well i don't know why it's signing in but that's fine i guess <clears throat> so tomorrow is my home campaign with my buddies and they are starting a new campaign tomorrow that i have an idea of what i want to do with it I want to have Hawaiian. I want to have a. Let's see. I want the final boss. Well, not the final boss, boss, but I want the major manipulator player to be a beholder. So I want to 
Holder. I have his name somewhere. Ventrue. Ventrue, the Beholder. Dude, Perry got you fish and chips. That's pretty cool. And he's gonna have a underling drow. gonna have an underling drow. Dude, I saw Ben Simmons at a three. What's up, Biggles? He's gonna have an underling drow named Yonder. She's gonna be a female sorcerer. Posing as a, as a dragonborn. In or oh no, I marked the map. No. In order to uh, trick some people. What's going on, man? Why are you frustrated, dude? So why can't I sign in? I want to sign into D and D Beyond. It's not letting me. D and D Beyond. People. All right, fair enough. I won't pry if you don't want to tell me. <laughs> D and D Beyond. Signed up. What is your problem with the Google? Why are you not letting me sign in with Google? Did that fix it? Bam. Ah. That, that fixed it. So let's see. I have a character I made. I just need to remember his... Or I just need to sign in and look at his stuff again. Um, I got this off stream, obviously. I don't want to log in on stream. having two non-broken hands. Hey, man. I get that, but with feet. <laughs> with legs. Ah, okay. So, let me try this again. Think about what I'm punching before I punch it, and that takes the satisfaction out of it. I guess you have a story to tell, people. Oh, dude, I did that once. I was real mad, and I punched a... Uh, I've told this story before. I was real mad. I punched a concrete pole. Busted up my hand a little bit. is like, this isn't your password, and you know it's your password. I, what, I know this is the password. Well, whatever, I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> Told my broken hand story, I guess I wasn't here. I thought you were. You're buying a zebra. You keep saying that, man. Yet I see no zebra. Have a drow. 
Maybe I can just have a basic. I can just have basic. It's not letting me log in. Long story short, I jumped in the air for a rebound. A guy collided with me and was like 220 and he fell on my hand. I've been really spotty when I'm in. Long story short, the zebra is... The zebra, us, the future, Mrs. Sneak. Is the future Mrs. Sneak? Oh. I'm going to eat now. Adios, friends. Uh, night to those in the night and morning to those in the morning. How'd you know pickles? It's okay. When we previously left off this campaign, well, when we previously left off this campaign, they were finished up in Moon's Landing. Adventurers had finished the moon's landing, and they had been given a, uh, a small keep outside of the city. As thanks for what they had done for the city by the kings. They used a lot of money to fix it up and <laughs> turn it into a cool place. So, I think what's going to happen... Is... Different stream with the quiet pops. Hey man, my parents are sleeping. I gotta be somewhat respectful. You know what I mean? Gotta be respectful a little bit. Um, they just finished up. I think what's gonna happen is I was gonna have one of my NPCs come and one of my important NPCs come and tell them about a problem down south that they were gonna go investigate down here in the scaled wetlands but I think I'm changing that I think what I want to do instead is have one of the city guard come and tell them there's been a string of murders within the city canals where several soldiers have been reported disorderly and drunk beyond uh, their normal limits, and then they wander off on their own and wind up dead in the canals. The first couple times this happens, you know, people think it's a tragic accident, you're drunk, you fall in the canal, you drown. But after, after several of these, the commander is a bit suspicious and wants to uh, have our PCs investigate for him. And I think I'll have that lead into the problem down south, which is where I want to send them eventually. I want to send them down here eventually. But I want to lead into it. I want to lead into it a bit better than just NPC shows up, tells them that there's a problem down south. So I think what I'm going to have happen is... They're going to go investigate, depending on if they're successful or not. It will depend on a lot of things, but they're going to find out that one of the guards is corrupt and has been hiding. Um, not hiding, covering up the murders of these guys because he's on payroll to our beholder, Vent uh, Venture. It's clearly a dolphin that killed him. Yeah, dude. And it shoots lasers. They find him. It, with a successful investigation, they will find him. And with a successful interrogation, he'll tell them that he's on payroll to Yonder, who is the second-in-command of Ventru. Now, what this guard isn't going to know is who Yonder really is. Yonder is going to be posing as a dragonborn. Whoops. 
down in the scaled wetlands. Trying to stir up conflict between the dragonborn in the region and the elves around them. And if, if need be, depending on if they succeed or not, they will find out that Yandor is actually trying to work with the cult of Tiamat in reviving the dead goddess. Which he's not actually doing, it's a ploy, but they won't know that. <laughs> I kind of miss playing this, even though I still had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I feel like playing on roll 20 would have been more helpful, because then you can actually visualize the battlefield and what you want to do, and where things are in relation to you. Like, Ogre did a great job with what he had, which was nothing. Um, I just think with a little extra prep, it, it goes a little bit better. Try and sign in one more time. Uh, what? What happened? What? What just happened? What is going on, D&D Beyond? Sign me in, dude. Stop being weird. D&D Beyond. Nope, it still didn't work. Okay. It's just not even doing it. it it's not even giving me, like, a failed login. It's just being like, nope. I, I give up. Soft give up. I understood the majority of it. I just never knew what to roll or what I was adding. Yes. Understandable. That comes with... That just comes with practice, you know. That just comes with playing it. Over time. Also, I think our sometimes our character sheets were a little hard to read. That's why I ended up moving mine over from what we had it on. Now here's my other question, because we have a bunch of other things that have been... They have a bunch of stuff that's outstanding where they haven't finished it yet. Or not a bunch of stuff, but they have some stuff that's outstanding. Like one of my... One of my PCs accepted a deal with an NPC that... Uh, whenever she needed him to do a favor for him, unspecified favor that he would be magically bound to do it. So, he I have one of my PCs magically bound to do a favor for one of my NPCs at some point. I just don't know what I want that to be yet. I've also got the attention span of a goldfish. Also understandable. I think, and I don't know if I love this idea, this is just kind of a spitball idea, is that... I, I, the more I think about it, the more I don't love it. Like it was, a, I I thought it was a good idea when I originally thought of it, but not anymore. Is that yonder, the drow disguised as a dragonborn, has a stone that will help unlock something later. But I don't love that idea as much as I used to. I mean, maybe, but. A, I don't know what it would unlock. I mean, I have an idea of what I want it to be, but it wouldn't really be part of this campaign. It would be another thing off to the side. And then I don't know why Yonder would have it, other than I just want him to have a piece of plot device. You know what I mean? And I don't, I don't know, I don't like that. 
or her, yonder's a her, but whatever. Um, I don't like the idea of just giving NPCs plot devices just to keep stuff moving. Even though, you know, it's a game, I gotta keep it moving and I gotta keep it interesting, so... It's gotta do that sometimes. I also have a player that I'm gonna be, I think, using and playing. Which I was going to show you guys, but I can't for some reason. Because DND Beyond won't let me log in for some freaking reason. Um, I think I'm going to have a character that joins them at some point. A Dragonborn... I'm not sure what it is yet. Honestly, I haven't, I'm not done making this character. Right now it's Ranger Warlock, but I'm not in love with that. I, I don't love that. <laughs> and I need to make up my mind about what he's going to be, because eventually he's going to enter the campaign, and then that's it, and I won't be able to change him anymore. So... Uh, so right now I've got Ranger... Ranger Warlock for this character, but I'm probably going to not go with that in the long term. Make the character a pig goat. Unfortunately, that's not a that's not a race I can do. Unless I just decide that it is, I guess. He's going to be a dragonborn because they're going to be in a dragonborn centric area. So you know, giving, making him a dragonborn makes sense to me. Um, but I just don't know. Because I'll get favored enemy, which lets me find my enemies and know about them more. A fighting style. Which, granted, could get either a plus two attack, a plus one AC. I don't really care about the dual wielding. Or dueling, I mean. Um, and I don't care about two weapon fighting. Spellcast. Spellcasting I want. I just don't know who, what kind of spellcaster I want. Ranger spells are not the most incredible. They don't get cantrips. And I don't think there's just a I don't think there's a lot of cool attack magics. Also, we get extra attack, which is nice, but there's so many other things that could give us an extra attack. Clerics don't get extra attacks, do they? I don't think they do. Top of my head. I always forget about clerics at fifth level. I don't remember what they get. I don't think it's a, another attack. No, they get just they get a destroy undead. That's what they get. Okay, uh, which is not an extra attack. I don't want to make him a barbarian. I know I don't want to make him a barbarian because then I can't use magic. We've got, I'm not going to use Barbarian, we've got Bard, which is a nice class, it gives inspiration, it has lots of high level magics, and it can inspire people, plus it can change its, its spells at uh, long rests. Clerics can also change their spells at long rests, and their healing is amazing. Druid is okay. Like, I like Druid, but I, if I want to dual class this character, the appeal of a Druid to me is the, the beast shape where you can turn into different creatures, and if I turn into a different creature, I lose... I kind of lose my effectiveness as a melee fighter. So I don't feel like that's the most incredible. Um, I could, I could do an Eldritch Knight fighter. But... That also still locks me out of some of the higher level magics. The monk is cool. Monk doesn't do magic. I mean, yeah, monk doesn't do magic. Paladin, same problem with the Eldritch Knight fighter. No cantrips. Locked out of higher level magics. Same problem with the ranger. So I think it comes down to... I don't know. 
Um, I think what it's going to come down to is either Warlock, but they lack spell slots, or Bard. Because one of my PCs is a Cleric. We don't need another Cleric. I don't need double up Clerics. I think what it comes down to is a Bard, and then making that Bard some kind of upfront fighter, whether that be a fighter, a paladin, or a ranger. Monk can do it too, but I don't want to do monk, and cleric could do it, or barbarian could do it too, but I won't use, I can't use magics as barbarian. If I make him a ranger, if I make him a frontline ranger, I could do that, where we just don't use a bow and arrow. Make him a fighting ranger. However, one of my PCs is a ranger. The easy choice, because my PCs are a ranger, paladin, and a cleric. The easy choice for me would be a bard fighter. But is that what I really want to do with it? <laughs> I would get the, the, hmm. I would get the, the resilience of a fighter with the magics of a bard. And depending on what kind of fighter I make, I could get some extra spells, but I wouldn't get extra spell slots, so that wouldn't be the most useful. I would have more stuff to use, but not more ways to use it. Um, because we've got, what are the archetypes here? I mean, I, I, I think I know them, but, oh, this isn't all the archetypes. Right, I'm not signed into D&D Beyond. God freaking dang it. D&D Beyond, you're killing me. can't sign in. Um, here we go. So we've got Champion, which is awesome. Cavalier, Battlemaster. Battlemaster's cool. Eldritch Knight, but I don't think that would be incredibly useful. Samurai. I don't think I want to do either one of these. Samurai get at third level. You, your intensity in battle can shield you and help you strike true as a bonus attack or as a bonus action on your turn. You can give yourself advantage. Oh, you also gain five temporary hit points, and this will increase at certain levels: ten at tenth and fifteen. Interesting. You can use this three times, and you can regain all expended use after a long rest. That's kind of cool. Okay. At seventh level, attention to detail, make a persuasion check, you gain a bonus. Eh. You gain proficiency and wisdom saving throws. Cool. Which I wouldn't have. Between the two? My proficiency in saving throws would be dexterity, charisma, strength, and constitution. So no, I wouldn't have proficiency in wisdom saving throws. So that would be useful. And if I didn't, you would instead gain proficiency in intelligence or charisma saving throw of my choice. Okay, that's cool. So this character would be proficient in five of the six saving throws, which would be really handy. Okay, that's kind of cool. And I would want to take this character to fighter level 11, I think, right? Because extra attack 2, which would give me 3 attacks per turn. I don't think he would make it to that high. 
but that would be the idea if I was playing him to, to level 20. But he won't. He's just an NPC. He won't be with the group the whole time, so he won't make it to level 20 like the PCs will. If I had to guess, he'd make it to 12? 13, maybe? And then... So if that's the case, I would split this up. Let's say he goes to 12, right? So we'd get to level 6 fighter. We'd have 2 attacks per turn. we get 2 ability score improvements and action surge. I mean, we got some stuff. I mean, obviously second wind and stuff. Um, but what would we get at Bard level 6 at this point? We wouldn't get any magical secrets, right? Depending on our, our college, which I think would be lore. Or valor, maybe? Oh, again, D&D Beyond. I'm not signed in. Um... What am I using for this one? Just the just the 5e wiki. Is there a search bar in this? Oh, there's a search bar. Oh, okay, this doesn't this is not what I want at all. Um Well, whatever. Uh, let's see. Nope. Nope. Same, same website. Um, let's type 5e in behind all that. There we go. So we would get, at level 6, we would get a counter charm which is awesome, and a Bard College feature. So if we picked College of Lore, we might get some magical secrets? I can't remember. Um, College of Lore. Additional magical secrets. At sixth level, you learn truth. Yes, okay. So he would get two spells from any other class. And cutting words. Alright, but what if we chose Valor? Medium armor, shields, martial weapons. Yep. You learn to inspire others. A creature that has our bardic inspiration die from you can roll that die and add the number to the damage. Oh, okay. Or, oh, and this is really cool. If a attack roll is made against the creature, it can use its reaction to roll the Bardic Inspiration dice and add the number rolled to its AC. <laughs> After seeing the roll, but knowing whether it hits or miss. Hmm. That's actually really cool. Oh, but then I waste... Oh, that sucks. So I, I didn't know that. You get an extra attack from College of Valor? Well, that would be a waste because I would already have an extra attack from... Um, fighter. So that would... That sucks. Okay. So I wouldn't take Bard... I wouldn't take him to Bard level 6 then? If I took the Valor college. I wouldn't take him to six. I would take him to five, because that would bring his inspiration dice up to eight. Yeah. And the only thing I would miss out on is counter charm. And some extra spell slots, but I wouldn't lose out on like another spell level slot. He would keep third level spells. If he goes to five instead of six, he only has two third levels instead of three. And he doesn't get another spell known. He 
mean, that's fine. That's not terrible by any means. That's not terrible. What if I just make him a bard? What if I just make him a lore bard? I didn't know they got. A se I didn't know they got second attack. What if he's not a? What if he's not a fighter at all? Obviously, what I would lose with that would become I'd lose the extra health because fighters have better better health rolls, and I would lose. Obviously, the fighting archetype stuff. Second wind, action surge. And no, I wouldn't get indomitable yet. Um, I would lose... Abilities, two ability score improvements. Obviously, he wouldn't be a samurai, so he couldn't do that thing where he gives himself advantage. Okay. So that's not the best. It's not the most efficient use of a class. Or like a dual class. Oh, and I would lose my proficiency in saving throws. the most useful in order to huh what would I do here because I'm trying to think of how I would spend this what if we don't do a valor college right what if we should pick a different college what if we pick a pick swords. We pick the College of Swords. College of Swords. You adopt a fighting style. Okay. You can't take a fighting style option more than once. At third level, whenever you attack, whenever you take the attack ap action, your walking speed increases by 10. And if, and if a weapon attack that you make as part of the attack hits a creature, you can use one of the following options. You can only use a blade flourish once per turn. You expend one use of your bardic inspiration to cause the weapon to deal extra damage. Okay, the damage equals the roll to the art bardic inspiration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also add that number. Oh, you also add that number rolled to your AC. Oh, that's cool. You can expend one of your bardic inspirations to cause to deal extra damage. Uh, damage the target you hit within five feet of you. Oh, wait. Why is that different? You can expend... You can expend one Bardic Inspiration to cause it to deal extra damage to a target you hit. Right. And it's the same as the Bardic Inspiration dice. But this also adds it to my C. This is just you... Deal extra damage to the target. Oh, and, 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 sorry. And to any other creature of your choice you can see within five feet of you. So if you have two, okay, so if you have two people around you, you can actually deal damage to both of them. I see. I missed the and. You expend one use, deal extra damage. Damage equals the number of inspiration. You can push the target five feet away from you, plus a number of feet equal to the number you roll on the die. You can then immediately use your reaction to move up to your walking speed. Ooh, okay, all this is cool. All of this is cool. Oh, and this has the same problem as the Valor College Bard, because you get another attack. 
instead of once, you can attack twice. So it would be the same thing where I would waste that. Hmm. That one thing is making it not mesh as well with a uh, fighter. I thought fighter was going to be the reason we got to attacks. However... It seems like we're going to get two attacks anyway. Okay, so maybe I'm... Hmm. Maybe I'm looking at this wrong. Maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way. Right? Maybe... Maybe instead of a bard fighter, because this is what I was thinking, magic bard with the fighter would make a dual classing up front fighter with magics. What if we don't do that and we do a bard warlock and forgo the fighter? Because then the warlock would actually give us extra spell slots with the packed magic. Warlock would give us extra spell slots because of packed magics, and we would get other, we would get Eldritch, Eldritch Blast, number one, and we would get some extra stuff as a Warlock, but I think we overlap with saving throws. We do. With Dex, or with Charisma, Charisma, oh, but it, you know what's nice? Both of them use Charisma as their casting ability. I wouldn't have to use two different casting uh, modifiers. Hmm. So what would we then gain as a warlock? And I could make this warlock a blade warlock to go with our valor, uh, to go with our valor and or swords, probably valor. obviously get our patron, our invocations, get the sword. What would be our otherworldly patron feature? Oh, right. I would have to see what the heck it is. Um, then would my patron become... Hmm. So let's get, let's get rid of fighter for now. Right. Let's just get rid of fighter for now. And let's talk about our warlock. Patron. So I would think it would be, I think it would either be the fiend or the celestial. Hello, private content. Oh, is this website down again? That sucks. Um, I think it would either be the fiend or the celestial. Maybe the great old one. I didn't think about that. What's a great old one give you? Dissonance whip, dissonant whispers, sending, detect magic, or er, sorry, detect thoughts, phantasmal force. Some of this is cool. You can touch the minds of creatures and communicate telepathically of within a ooh with a creature within thirty feet of you. I mean, that's cool. Telepathic talk is awesome. Um, okay. So that's a great old one. And I don't remember what the fiend gives me exactly. Burning hands command, scorching ray, blindness, deafness, fireball, stinking cloud. I'm not in love with this one as much. When you reduce a creature to zero, you gain temporary HP equal to your charisma plus your warlock level. Uh, again, not as much in love with that one as being able to communicate telepathically. And then the celestial is a bunch of like 
healing, guiding bolt, plus restoration, revivify. I love free. I love the celestial. He's so cool. Or they're so cool. Talk to animals, so you just be SpongeBob. I mean, yeah. Or insert anything, any kind of character that talks to animals. You get sacred flame and light, which is awesome. But you also get an ability to channel celestial energy. You have a pool of d6s. Number of d6s. Or the number of dice in the pool equals one plus your level. As a bonus action, you can heal one creature you see 60 feet of you, spending dice from the pool. The maximum number of dice you can spend at once equals your charisma modifier. Roll the dice you spend. So this is, we got extra healing from this. We get not only do we get cure wounds uh, and revivify, we get extra healing that's specific to us that we can use as a bonus action that can can be more useful than healing word because it's not a spell slot; it's just an ability. Healing word, I think, has more well. I don't know, because let's see, you can heal a creature, there's a maximum you can use to this, I think. One creature spending dice from the pool, You men, ugh, maximum number of dice you can spend at once equals your modifier. So yeah, up to five. I can only spend five d6s, which is, uh, yeah, which is way better than healing word. But I don't get to add a modifier to it. So, healing word at... Fifth level would be 5d4s plus my modifier, which could be 5d4 plus 5. But then this could potentially be 5d6s plus nothing. So maximum healing we would have 30 from this ability, or maximum healing off of healing word, you would get... Oh, 29. You would actually, you get one extra maximum. They're about, they're the same, basically. The ability can do one extra healing at maximum than healing word could, if my modifier was maximized, was maximum. Which we're assuming it is, because we're assuming I can have 5d6s, which would also mean my modifier is maximum. <laughs> So we're on the even playing field like we have a maximum modifier. Um, yeah, even if you did it with, it, even if you did it where your maximum modifier was four, you could do 24 max healing off the ability and 24 max healing off of the, no, no, uh, 20, Oh, did I do it wrong? I think I did it wrong. Hold on. 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. Oh, the maximum healing word could do... Wow, the maximum healing word could do at fifth level with a max modifier would be 25. So it is worse. And then at fourth level, it would be... 21, which would be worse than 24. Yeah, so it, the ability is actually better. And it doesn't use a spell slot, which makes it, in my opinion, that makes it even more useful. Let's see, you have resistance to radiant damage when you cast a spell that deals radiant or fire. You can add your charisma modifier to the one radiant or fire roll of that spell against one of its targets. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. I guess Guiding Bolt is Radiant Damage, and Guiding Bolt would be a big one, because Guiding Bolt is really handy. The Celestial, man! The Celestial's such a good patron. Because Guiding Bolt is 46 damage, and then with that, it would be plus my modifier. And it gives the next person that attacks advantage, which is super nice. But 
story-wise and role-play-wise, would it make sense for this Dragonborn to be a, have a Celestial as his patron? I guess it wouldn't matter. It's a patron, it's not a deity. Patrons can find you and give you their power. You don't have to choose a patron like you would choose a deity that spoke to you. So yeah, I guess that wouldn't matter, but let me look at Hexblade. I don't think I want this. Shield is nice. I'm gonna be honest. Shield, nice. Blink, also nice. Blur, also nice. Branding Smite and Wrathful Smite. I could use one or the other. I guess I'll leave the music change. Elemental Weapon's kinda cool. That's a little better for my sanity. Um, oh, whoops. I did not mean to do that. You either gain the ability to place a baneful curse on somebody, you can hex somebody. Any attack roll is a crit on a 19 or 20. I mean, that's cool, but not exactly what we're looking for. I mean, if I'm in the fray, right? Because I want this to be a, I want this to be an upfront fighter character. And if we're in the fray, then he needs to do a lot more damage. But at the same time, I don't know. I'm not the most in love with. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of Hexblade. I know a lot of people like Hexblade, but it, I just... I'm not in love with it. I think he would be a Celestial Warlock with a Bard of Valor and if I could get into D&D Beyond, I could freaking make it. But D&D Beyond is being real dumb. And I can't sign in for some reason. I can sign in on my computer, or on my laptop, which is super odd. Either way, I think this character is going to become, not a vehicle, but a step in the direction they want to go where they're going to get to the south, right? They're going to come down here. They're going to come down to the scaled wetlands and find... Well, maybe not, but they're going to come to the Scaled Wetlands, and they're going to learn about Yonder. And my Dragonborn character is going to be opposed to Yonder, because he's going to know Yonder is bad news. He's not going to know that Yonder's a drow, but he's going to know that Yonder's bad news, and suspect that he's working with the cult of Tiamat. Meet up with our PCs and then sort of point them on the direction they need to be looking, even though he doesn't know either. I think he just becomes more of a helper than a plot device. And he doesn't need to stay long. Like, I don't think he's going to stay in the campaign forever. Unless one of my PCs drops out, which they might. One of them says, one of them is talking about they got busy recently and they might not be able to play anymore. So we may need another person, which may end up being me. We'll see. 
I could have him, I could have this Dragonborn join them. Again, not the whole time, but for a while and then leave once they've accomplished what he set out to help them with. Because he's not interested in helping them with the overarching campaign that they're trying to go fight a beholder. Eventually they'll figure out it's a beholder and, and they'll head that direction. Probably not with the Dragonborn. Once once Yonder's dead, I think his commitment to the party ends. Because his problem is taken care of. Granted, I don't know. If they convince him to go, obviously, then he would go. But just thinking about how this Dragonborn, I want this Dragonborn to play... He was invested in this area because there's dragon. his dragonborn family lives in the area, and his friends, and this is where he grew up. And he feels they're being manipulated by this outsider. He doesn't know anything about a beholder, he's only worried about Yonder. So when Yonder's not a problem anymore, he, he would... That would be the end of his commitment. That he would really be invested up until that point. Um... Now, where would I want them to go down? If they were going down to fight a Beholder, they have to go into the Underdark, which means they have to enter the Underdark somewhere. There, you know, there, there are some cave entrances around here that they could go in. But then the Underdark becomes a, the Underdark becomes a whole new animal. It's the Underdark, and. They could run into Ithalids, Umber Hulks, Displacer Beasts, dr more and more Drow, which they probably would run into. And the Freak, the, the Underdark is just a bad place. Duragar. So it would become a, it would become an Underdark campaign at that point if they went that direction. Which I guess they could not if they chose not to do that. Uh, but that's kind of where it would lead to. Now the the question becomes, what is Ventru's point of all of this? Why is Ventru manipulating Yonder and helping him? And what does Yonder gain from all this? Or what does Ventru gain from all this? I think... And I actually have this written down, because, so I, this is the this is the motivation I had. But I, I'm not incredibly sure if I love this. Ventru is manipulating Drow and other Underdark denizens to confront the surface dwellers in the scale in the scaled wetlands. Why, why, why does this beholder care? That's a thought for me, I guess, to think about. I don't even, I don't have to have that done by tomorrow. They're not going to find the beholder tomorrow. They're not going to find it within the next four or five sessions, I would imagine. But that is definitely a thing I need to figure out. Why is this beholder involved? What does it want? It's got to want something. And it can't just be that it wants to kill people. That's lame to me. And it can't just be that it wants to conquer a little bit of land on the surface. I don't think beholders care. It could want to make a crime syndicate. That would make sense to me. Where it could... Kind of... Have control from the shadows and the underground. But still have control on the surface. Kind of taking over the void... That, had, that is in the world right now because the Veil are dead. Or, it wants something, right? But what would that something be? The easy answer to me is the thing that I, the, the key that Yonder has, but why wouldn't he just kill Yonder and take it instead of using Yonder to help him? You know, whatever, the Dragonborn. Some motivation, some motivational um, 
strategy for what this beholder is doing needs to be figured out by me. He wants to get very powerful so he can get laid. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna be honest with you, Hawaiian guy. I'm not sure. Not sure the thing that doesn't seem to have a dick <laughs> can use getting laid as a motivation. You know what I mean? <laughs> No one would see that coming. No, not even me. I mean, like, beholders are so... Oh, what the heck? What was that? Oh, nice. I put... I got the beast cherry in here. Okay, I was trying to do that earlier. Um... Beholders are very arrogant, xenophobic and vicious creatures. Beholders were quick to attack enemies, including anyone they deemed not like themselves. Beholders, as a rule, were violent and greedy, hungering for both wealth and the power over others. So, control, like I said, making a sort of network like a, a criminal network makes sense to me as, as it could be a motivation. This was made all the more complicated since more than one variety of beholder existed, each believing itself to be the principal bodily perfection, and they viewed other beholders who differed from this image in the most minute details as loathsome enemies and inferiors. They were divided into separate entities. Each of these entities thought and acted on its own accord, even though it was bound to the same bodies. The other half of the mind, neither half of the beholder's mind trusted the other, so they hid a lot from each other, creating a very primitive relationship. Sane beholders were beholders whose minds were not divided. They were still two entities within, but neither hid anything from the other, making a less paranoid beholder. Uh, however, the persona of a... Sane Beholder was just as likely to be considered insane by any non-Beholder. Because there were two entities within a single Beholder, the Beholder should always be addressed by its full name when in conversation with them, or they would be perceived, or they would perceive it as speaking to one of the entities. So, the, again, the control thing makes sense to me. Where the beholder would want power and control over people from a shadows because it's xenophobic. It doesn't want to be out in the open. But I, it, while that's a good start, that's not the end of it, right? While that's a good start to the motivations, that's not the end of our motivations. I need a little bit more for that. Why would it do that? Why does it get yonder? Why does it do that? Why would it want the scaled wetlands specifically? Often found occupying deep underground caverns. Yes, these layers were carved out by beholders themselves using the eye rays. Layers were built vertically rather than horizontally. Uh, with beholder architecture frequently exhibiting a large number of vertical shafts, which the beholder and other flying creatures could use with ease. While walking creatures found it navigation hindered. Beholders worshipped, I don't know how to say this, Gazemidid and the Great Mother. Who's the Great Mother again? I know the other one. Okay. Tyranny, fertility, uh, were beholder children in their safety against against the drow. Okay. Um, Eh. 
I don't know, man. Hey, Xanathar. I feel like Xanathar was the leader of a thieves guild. So, and Xanathar wasn't actually like, Xanathar was, I think, two beholders. It's just a title. It's not like a person, as far as I remember. This is, there's a beholder among the Zentarum? Huh. Okay. Interesting. Weird. Did not know that. All right. Learn something new. Um. Yeah, I would. I would. I th again, this isn't something prevalent to tomorrow, so it's not something I need to really flesh out right this second. But starting with power and control and then working my way out from there into what the more specific motivations are makes sense to me. Um, yonder, our actual face villain, who we're going to be seeing a lot of. I think this one's easy, really. Yonder wants to extend the control of her house, the drow house she's from. Easy way to do that is to expend influence by stealing surface dwellers, selling them in slave trade, getting more money, getting more followers and more slaves from the surface. This, this seems a little bit more um, easier to put together to me. Hey, what's up, PK Lost? How you doing, man? PK Lost! So I think what I'm I think what I'm gonna do is make this Dragonborn. What was it originally? It's a it's a Ranger something. It's a Ranger Warlock. Okay, so I, I circled back to Warlock. I think what I'm going to do is make it a Bard Warlock and make it a Bard Warlock Blade or uh, Pact of the Blade and either a Valor College, probably Valor College, or Swords College. Probably Valor, though. And then probably pick the Celestial Patron. What's going on? I'm just doing some... Um, talking about my D&D &D campaign that I'm going to run tomorrow. Just kind of fleshing out the stuff that I want to do with it and doing a tiny bit of world building in my my D&D uh, &D world. I think making, making one of my NPCs CS. And then the question becomes what levels do I want to... If I'm going to start this guy at what? Level 8? I'm going to start this NPC at level 8. Then we want to go Warlock. I want to have the Blade packed, so at least 3rd level. And I want to get the Valor College, so at least 3rd level. I have 2 levels to play with. Possibly 3 if I want to make him ninth. Neat! Thanks, man! If I take this guy, if I take him to Warlock 5, I would get a, my, my spell slot would jump to third and I would get a third invocation. I would know an extra spell. Yeah. However, so let's say, let's say I take him to, let's say I take him to Warlock 5. That leaves three levels of Bard. which would become this, just expertise, just bard college. I wouldn't get that ability score improvement quite yet. And my D8, I wouldn't get the bardic inspiration of a D8 yet. Bobacus, 
What's up, man? How you doing today, dude? Just, uh, what's the haps? Just talking about D&D in this campaign that I'm going to be running tomorrow. And an NPC that I'm going to make. And so I would get... Okay. Hmm. I wouldn't have third level spell slots yet. Well, I wouldn't have third level spell slots from my bard perspective. I would have them as a warlock, though. Because I would have my... This is still the celestial. Whoops. Um, I would have my... At fifth level... Uh, third slot level, I would have two spell slots, so that wouldn't change. That wouldn't change, because it would still be two spell slots at third level, at fifth level for a bard. The only difference that would really matter was the d8. Inspiration. Ah, and I wouldn't get my bard college feature. But I don't think my sixth level feature is incredibly useful. Valor. It's just extra attack. I would still get my combat inspiration, which is awesome, but I wouldn't get that extra attack yet. Hmm, okay. So this character would be at 8th level and would not have an extra attack yet. That's... It's, it's sketch... But also, could I make up with that with Eldritch Invocations, with Thirsting Blade? I don't think I could yet. I think I would have to get my Warlock to level 6 to get that. Or no, 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 I would get another Invocation here. And I think that might give me Thirsting Blade. Pack to the Blade. I know what Pack to the Blade does. I don't need to read that. I need to know, because I think I can get Thirsting Blade as my invocation at fifth level. Which will give me two attacks. But that's also kind of a waste anyway, because I would get my second attack naturally as a bard as a Valor College bard. So there's no point to have Thirsting Blade because, you know, Valor College gives me one naturally. Hmm. So have I made him a sixth level bard instead? We would get our, obviously, we'd get our next, our double attack. We'd have three third level spells, nine spells known, three cantrips. Uh, we'd have a total of ten spell slots. We'd also get counter charm and our D8 of Arctic Inspiration, but this would pull our Warlock back down to level two, which means I wouldn't even be packed to the blade yet. I would just be here. Ugh. Which would give me, which would give me two extra first level spell slots. And I mean, that's good, but especially the two extra first level spell slots would be good right now, especially with the Celestial, because one of them could be Guiding Bolt, and that's two extra Guiding Bolts I could pop off. And of course, if I make this character level 9, then I can just take Pack to the Blade. But my PCs are level 8, and I'd like to stay level 8, you know, to match up with them. Regardless of this, they're not going to meet this character. They probably won't meet this character tomorrow, I would imagine, those at the pace they go. Um... They'll probably be in Moon's Landing the whole time, investigating the murders. 
potentially, potentially they will hear about Yonder. Maybe not. If they don't hear about Yonder from investigating, if they fail their investigation checks, I will uh, have another way to go about this. Yo, PK lost. PK lost. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the basement. I appreciate that, man. So if they don't, let's say they fail all their investigations, which is impossible, but they fail their investigations, right? They find the corrupt guard and he doesn't give them the name. He doesn't tell them that Yonder is who they need to go after. Then I have a backup. My original plan, which is lame, and I changed it because it was lame, um, where I had an NPC, one of my big major NPCs, come and tell them, hey, I'm a citizen down south in the scaled wetlands, and I have a concern this new dragonborn has come in and is starting to stir up problems. The cult of Tiamat may be involved. If you'd like to come and check this out, that'd be wonderful. But again, I feel that's lame. I don't want to just spoon feed them that and send them straight there. I'd like them to find that information out themselves, that, hence the murder investigations. But if they fail those, if they just absolutely fail all of that, I have that as a backup. The problem becomes they've seen one of the characters has met <laughs> this high level NPC before and knows a little about him and knows he's not down there from down there. So it'll be a little weird, I think. Sometimes NPCs are a few levels higher. So being level nine would be no big deal. True. This is true. He could be a level above them. Hawaiian guy, thank you for the seven biddies. Thank you for the Christmas biddies. The late night Christmas biddies. Also, Yondor is actually a PC character. Well, not a PC, but a NPC character. Like a player class type of character that I made. I'm not just using a... Um, I could, I mean, I could just use a drow... Uh, like an arch. Uh, no, not sorry, not that. That's too strong. Um, no, I can't use that either. Uh, I had an idea about this. I don't remember what it is now. Um, oh, a lul, uh, lul priestess. Yes. So it could be a lul priestess, but I'm not not using that. I actually made. Yondor as a playable character for me personally. Yondor is a level 15 sorcerer of shadow magics. Which will be fun. I think it'll be a fun fight at, toward the end. Yerp? Piggles. Why are you yerping me? Is this a homemade or generated map? It looks good. Uh, this is this is a map I made myself. It's homemade. I made uh, I I made this. I had surgery recently, so I hello music. I had surgery recently, so what I did every day while I was just on the mend was make this map. This was my love child while I was just laid up. <laughs> I'm gonna turn that up just a tiny, tiny bit. You're yerping because boredom? Gotcha. I wish I could show you this character. I just don't know why D&D Beyond is being weird. So this is a level 15 shadows, shadow magic, shadow magic sorcerer, Yonder. Gonna be disguised as a dragonborn. Gonna be full dragonborn disguised at the beginning before revealed to be a drow at level 15 uh, she's got 8th level spells um, including oh she's only got the one she's only got uh, horde, horde wilting but she's got some cool stuff she's got banishment chain lightning disintegrate 
Lightning Bolt. Obviously Counterspell. Darkness Fly. Some good, some good stuff in here. We got Greater Invisibility, although I'm thinking about getting rid of that. I'm not in love with Greater Invisibility as much as I used to be. Welcome back, Piggles. The question also for me becomes... The Cult of Tiamat. If I want to use that as an angle, why are they why why are they getting pulled in by this random dragonborn that just recently showed up? I mean, I have an easy answer. In my campaign, similar to in the home campaign, similar to the to the stream campaign, um, my PCs also released an ancient red dragon into the world, just like the stream campaign did. So. Releasing an Ancient Red Dragon into the world could be a sign to the Cult of Tiamat that the return of Tiamat is coming and that the summoning will finally work and yada 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 yada. It's Cult of Tiamat, Cult of Tiamat. Um, but, I don't know, why would Yonder... The question becomes Yonder in the Cult of Tiamat. Or if that's even a thing I want to use. If that's not just a ploy from Yonder, you know what I mean? She could use the invisibility to follow the PCs since she is a boss character. You're correct. The only problem with that... You are correct. The only problem with that is that um, greater invisibility doesn't last very long. Greater invisibility only lasts for one minute. So she could only do that for one minute. Normal invisibility lasts for an hour. But because greater invisibility you can stay invisible while attacking and doing all the all the different like actions you can take it doesn't last as long so normal invisibility as far as a stealth mechanic is actually more useful to you than greater invisibility <laughs> also i'm tempted to and this is this is kind of going back to what i had said earlier I want to give Yondor a magic item. I want her to have a magic item of some kind. Whether that is the key that I talked about earlier that she's holding on to for some reason is up for debate. Again, I don't know what the key would do yet. There's a lot of things in this world that I could have a magical sort of lock and key or magical sort of divining rod device that leads them somewhere. But another way I could go about it, if I wanted to go this route with it, would be Yondor has something, like maybe it's a summoning item, one of many, she dies, the PCs then take it, and like a lich has been looking for it forever. Or so, not even a lich, That's but somebody's been looking for these items for a long time, and they find the PCs, and then we have a side quest kind of thing, where this person wants what they have, and whether I want to do that host, uh, I was going to say hostily, but if I want to do that violently or not I feel like that would be more of a trickery kind of thing the PCs grab this key off yonder they don't know what it is right so this person comes and finds them because they've heard about yonder and yonder had the thing but yonder's dead so the PCs have it this person comes and finds them tells them that it's something right not what it actually is and tells them that there's more of them and that he or she will hire them to go find them for him or her and bring them back because it's something of use. Maybe it's, it seals the red dragon back in its, in its prison or it is key to a treasure. I don't know. I don't, there's not a lot of things I can think of that are incredibly compelling. 
I mean, obvi the stupid obvious ones that I just said, but... <sighs> I don't feel like they're gonna... I don't feel like my PCs are gonna buy that. I just don't feel like they'll buy it. It could be more... It could be a better play... It could be, actually, a better play to be like, Oh, you found this thing from the drow that I've been looking for because I need to protect them from the drow who took them from me. I have several of them already to prove that you would to prove to you that they were mine. Could you go find the rest of them for me? When in reality this person's tricking them, has already found a couple of them, and needs all of them to do some kind of something. Ritual, summoning, ascension, <laughs> whatever. But the problem with that for me becomes, what if I divert them a little too much off of the main path I want them to go down? Which it's D&D, &D, right? So who cares? Ultimately, anything could happen. They could leave the entire continent and go to one of the other continents. But, you know, I, I want to keep them somewhat on this path I've given them. Again, if they don't want to, that's fine. I'll adjust. I'm the DM. I'll adjust to what they want to do. But I don't want to purposely <laughs> I don't want to purposely accidentally take them off of my own story path. Does if that makes sense. I don't want to sabotage myself. Played myself. Um So we have Ventru. Ventru is the beholder at the end. They would fight. Oh, I need a. I need a. Uh, I don't need it, but I, I would like an encounter calculator or something. Um, Kobold. Kimbo slice. Kobold. Fight club. Nope, not Kobold fighter. Kobold. Fight Club. Go with Fight Club is all right. I don't trust it the most, but it's it's a good general indicator. Um, so let's see, we we have one beholder in lair, and we have three PCs at level. It's still deadly. Okay. Because of legendary actions. That makes sense to me. Um, so that would be three PCs level 10. Let's say we have a fourth PC. Let's say let's say my Dragonborn sticks with them, right? And does this fight with them. Still deadly. Four PCs at level 10. Beholder and Lair. Still deadly. I don't know if I believe that. But that is what's, that's what it's saying. So what if we make it at 12? It becomes medium, and if I drop a player out... Okay, three PCs at level 12 make it a hard fight. Three PCs at level 11 will make it deadly. Okay. Fairish. Whoa, hi, how long has this been up? What up, Zach? Uh, I've been going for like an hour and a half. Yeah, I've been going for an hour and a half, exactly, almost. I just got the notification. It's a secret, dude. I put it in the stream. That's why I said it's a secret. <laughs> what the Fuckle Twitch? Let me try a different calculator encounter. Let me try a different counter and calculator. Would you like me to leave? I mean, no. I, I mean, you do whatever you want. But. Did I check out D&D Beyond? What do you mean? Oh. The encounter calculator on D&D Beyond? Uh, I don't trust that. Because <laughs> it's like still in beta. I like this. Personally, I actually really like this. Um... Encounter for four. 
Encounter for four at 11th level. Twelfth level? Okay. Okay, so they agree. Okay, okay, they agree. Let's say, let's say we want it to be hard. Okay, so th they agree. The encounter thingy? Well then, did Ogre update his roll 20 sheet? Oh, I don't know. He might have, he might not have, I don't know. All right, so both both encounter calculators agree that that's a problem. I mean, it's not a problem. So a fourth character at level 12 makes a 14 CR encounter not not hard. So let's let's make it 3. Okay. That says it's hard. Sorry, deadly? This doesn't say it's deadly. The other one said it's deadly. Okay, there's a little disagreement. That's fine. I trust, I actually trust this a little bit more than the Cobalt Fight Club one. Because we would have, let's see, if we had three characters, kill us, Dia, murder us all. This isn't your guys' campaign. This is the campaign tomorrow. This is my home campaign. Um, so we would have... So I've gotten it? Hell yeah, dudes, I've gotten it. Oops. Bro, I put a lot of effort into this map for me not to use it a lot. <laughs> uh, no, not Notepad++. I have Notepad++. So if we have, let's say, if I'm running the encounter, right? And we have Beholder. And then we have... I'm just going to put them in as classes. I'll, I'll, I know their names, but I'll put them in as classes. Power them... And my ranger has a wolf companion, so. And then we have, because beholders have legendary actions. Legendary actions. The beholder can take three legendary actions, choosing from only one at legendary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a random eye ray. Uses one random eye ray. So what the what the this is what this is what the order would look like in practice. That's yikes. That's a yikes. That's a that's a super yikes. A cleric and a paladin. Yeah, dude! Cobalt Fight Club seems like a funny idea. It's a really nice, like, encounter calculator thing. It's not, like, the perfect thing, but it's nice. Do they have lair actions in this encounter? They will, because it's in lair. So, yes, it will also have lair actions, which is on initiative 20. Um... A 50-foot square area of ground within 20 feet becomes slimy. Difficult terrain. Walls within 120 feet of the beholder sprout grasping appendages until initiative 20 count. Each creature, creature of the beholder's choice that starts its range within 10 feet of a wall um, must succeed on a DC 15 dexterity check. That's not terrible. Also, I just want to point out, so, and this is also some of my stuff. Uh, my ranger, so... This character, because they have magic items. This character has the ability to fly. It has wing. This character has wings. This character also has one use. It, this character also has a legendary resistance. So that 
This person can throw this person can fly and has a legendary resistance. Uh, this person has an AC of 21. And this person has. Uh, basically 150 temp health. How? What? How? So this guy has infinity stones. No way becomes Jeff Ramsey. Well, because I gave him legendary resistance. They met they met an NPC a long time ago, and they met an NPC a long time ago, and this woman offered a deal to my ranger and said she would give him something of, of major value, which legend one legendary resistance is, if he would do her a favor in the future, and she wouldn't tell him what it is, but she, he would be magically bound to complete this favor, whatever it ends up being that she asks him to do. He agreed to this. So, he has a legendary resistance, but he also owes this lady a favor, whatever I decide it to be in the future. It is. It was super sketchy, and everybody else told him not to do it, and uh, he did it anyway. How bad is the lady? She's a hag. She was a, uh, she is a green hag. A favor. No, he was, he's true neutral. Also, she was not, she didn't look like a hag. She was disguised at the time. She was disguised as a beautiful traveling woman. So, he has a legendary resistance, so he can, he can, need be, right, he, let's say, worst case scenario, let's say worst case scenario, our beholder hits him with the, um, hits him with the death ray, right, or the disintegration ray, he can save. He has one get out of jail free save. And he's got a wolf. I know that says wolf wings. It's two words. Um, they also all have magic item or they also all have magic weapons that they've account that they've acquired. By the way, they're level 8 right now. So they've we've been doing this a while. Um, they also have magic weapons. The ranger's weapon is actually, I think, the best one. But that's up to for debate. The also problem becomes my paladin potentially won't be playing anymore. Because he got really busy and he told me he may not be able to play anymore. So if that becomes the case, I think my PCs need me to enter the fight. I think at that point my Dragonborn has to come with them. They won't do this at level 8. They wouldn't do this at level 8. This this is a level 11 or 12. This is a this is a, a, a end of end of adventure kind of fight. You you've missed the whole hour and a half talk about this campaign. This would be the end boss for this story that they would be going through worst case scenario is if the beholder started singing boulevard of broken dreams and abyssal at the top of its lungs i hate twitch so much <sighs> oh also just for a funsies um just so just for funsies um when they were level six, they wandered into a cave and ran into this. But it was frozen in ice and it couldn't it couldn't actually attack them. 
Which is, this is a CR-20, by the way. So this would have, uh, this would have really hurt them a lot. I just got the notification when I joined. Oh god, no. Oh. I know. TPK. I try not to kill my characters, but, um... If it happens, it happens. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to keep you alive, either. So let's say we don't have this paladin, right? Let's say this becomes my dragonborn. Let's say this becomes my dragonborn bard. My dragonborn, um... Bard Warlock, which I think is what I, I'm going to go with, is Bard Warlock. That character doesn't have any magic items, unlike the Paladin, who had es essentially a cloak of a cloak of amazing. Yeah, Bard Lock. This would be hard. This is a hard fight. Like. This would be real hard. <laughs> In lair, lair actions, and because the party's only three people, it they they're getting hit every every go. The uh, legendary actions become a real problem. What archetypes? So my cleric is he's a war cleric, he's a beast master, and. Um, my paladin is a vengeance paladin. Also, I wonder what a C, I wonder what CR level 15 sorcerer would be against these guys. I don't know how I would check that. Um, let's see. Okay, that's just a cobalt scale sorcerer. Bardlock? Oh, he would be a, um, his patron's a Celestial, he would be a Valor College, and a Pact Blade, Blade Pact. Warlock. So Valor College would give him extra attack at level 6, and he would get the magical weapon via the Pact, and, uh, He'd have all those magics. He would also get the extra spell slots because of the pack boon slots. He can change out his other things because he's a bard and he would have a D8 of inspiration. It's pretty good. I like him. I haven't made him quite yet, but I like him. I like the idea of him. Also, the um, College of Valor use of inspiration is, is really handy. I didn't realize it did it. Like, I didn't realize you could add it to your AC. I like College of Whispers. College of Whispers is nice. I've always gravitated toward Lore College, though, just because of the extra spells. I was playing a bard recently, um, and we I got to level 18 because we finished the campaign, and uh, I grabbed Meteor Swarm and Wish as my two, my last two magical secrets. If you kill off um, my character, I have a really, really stupid character idea. Oh, geez, what'd you wish for? So the char the, <laughs> the bard I was just playing, uh, I made him so that he was in debt, massively in debt to bard college. So I made him use the wish spell to wish his debt to bard college away. <laughs> Uh, all right, so back to this. An initiative count 20, we would also be having. I need this for my truck. See, do I make it? I feel like I could be mean to make it a death tyrant, but I'm not gonna, I don't think I wanna do that. 
It's already CR 14. I'm not. It wouldn't be that much harder. Lair actions are not. The lair actions are not incredible. An eye opens the solid surface within 60 feet. One random eye ray of the beholder shoots from that eye on a target of the beholder's choice. You can see the eye then closes and disappears. I mean, that one's the one that I would... That was that would be the problem one. And it can't repeat until they've all been used. So I have to cycle through all three of them. And it can't use the same effect two rounds in a row yet. So I'd have to cycle through all of them. The hard one, I think, would become... I think the difficult one would become the, where is it? The paralyzing ray? Because I don't think anybody has an amazing amount of constitution. Oh, and uh, the, I didn't realize the veneration ray is con as well. Uh, the ranger doesn't. I know the ranger doesn't have like any con at all. He had an 11 con forever. He finally has 12 con now. So it's a plus one. Why a beholder? Because this is my final enemy for this part of the story campaign. I'm gonna have, so the story campaign, just quick, 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 quick catch up what we've been talking about for an hour and a half. Um, They're going to find out about a person named Yonder. Yonder is a, is a drow sorceress who I made. She's a level 15 shadow magic sorceress. She's going to be disguised as a dragonborn. Um, they're going to find out that this person, Yonder, has been trying to um, agitate the cult of Tiamat in this region down here in the scaled wetlands. However... Yonder is actually just a tool that's being used by Ventru, who is the Beholder. Um, and Ventru is trying to reestablish a criminal underground because the veil, the veil, which was the gigantic criminal underground that was continent wide, no longer exists and was totally and utterly wiped out. Um, so there's like a, a power vacuum of criminal activity right now as far as major criminal activity. And Ventru is going to try and seize the opportunity to make a new mass criminal underground. This is all happening at the same time as us. This is a year ahead of... This is a year... Yeah, ahead of you guys. Because they finished a campaign... They finished their campaign which is in the same present day year you guys are in. And then we took a year time skip where they now work for, they now work for the two Kings of Rayleigh here in Moon's Landing and they have a keep that they work in. Um, and we took a year where they paid a bunch of money. They fixed up the keep, they hired crew, they hired staff in the keep and, and they became like, vessels and hands of the kings to do some bidding for them and now after a year this will have come up are we a year earlier or later than them you're a year earlier than they are so if they were 19 you guys would be 1999 and they'd be the year 2000 i think that's a little easier way to describe it The campaign they just finished that got them to level eight um, was present day, same year that you guys are in. I was born in 99. <laughs> and so, yeah, we're gonna start Instead of doing the stupid lame thing I was going to do. No, they went forward in time. They didn't go back in time. They started their campaign 
at level one, they started the campaign in the same year you guys did, and it took them a, it took them months to finish that, and then see your jump, and they're a year ahead of you now. Um, so they're going to get a call from, not a call, they're going to get a visit from one of the city guard who's going to tell them that people have been drowning in the reservoirs in Moon's Landing and originally again this wasn't suspicious because there were reports of drunkenness and disorderly conduct by these couple of guards and they were found drowned in, in the reservoir just an unfortunate accident you know it happens sometimes people get drunk fall in the reservoir and drown but now this has happened four and five times the captain of the guard is seeing a problem and when he reports it to his superiors he kind of gets brushed off um, so he goes to our hands of the kings our PCs and to circumvent his superiors and ask them to investigate into this they go investigate into this depending on how their investigations go they either find out the information they need or if they utterly and absolutely fail, one of my NPCs will come and tell them where to go. <laughs> Which I don't want to do that. I would hate, I would really hate to do that. But if they don't, if they just fail completely, I'll give them a direction to go. And then they'll go to the Skilled Wetlands. Which is a Dragonborn-centric area. And they'll try and find Yonder, who is disguised as a Dragonborn. They'll meet my character, Delore. My Dragonborn character, Delore. And then we'll see what happens from there. They won't make it this far tomorrow. I know they won't. This is all going to take... This is like a three or four session thing that I just described. <laughs> I mean, if they make it... If they, like, nail their investigation checks, I guess they could make it. But I doubt it. I doubt they'll nail all of them. <laughs> Just like I doubt they'll fail all of them. Do I want the Cult of Tiamat to be actually in this or not? The threat of the Cult of Tiamat has already been established. I've established it. It's a thing. It's going to get mentioned. I'm using them as a sort of plot device. Am I going to use them for real? Is the question. Because the Cult of Tiamat is actually doing something right now. Legitimately. They're, they're actually doing something. In the world. As it is. So. I guess it's up to my PCs. You know what I mean? It's up to them. As a DM, I, gotta, I need to be flexible. And it's up to them. If they get involved with the Cult of Tiamat they get involved with the Cult of Tiamat. If they don't, they don't. I'll flip a coin. It was Tails. I don't know what it means, but it was Tails. It means that Tails isn't going to be in the next Sonic game. Depending on if I want to give Yondor the key that I'm thinking about, or the item that I'm thinking about, that will lead us into a whole other thing, which could be a side distracting thing, which might sabotage myself. So I need to think about that. I need to think about what Ventru really wants and how he wants to go about doing this. And not just Ventru's an evil beholder who wants control. I need to figure out how he wants to do that. Because... He's using Yondor. I've established that. I've established that he's using Yondor. Why and how does that happen? Why would this drow who wants to help advance her house within... Um, what's the... I know what the city is. I'm just having a brain fart. The drow city. There's shadow dragons? I don't think there are shadow dragons in 5e. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think they're in 5e. We have... Y 
Yondor. Yondor could kill them, I think. Level 15 sorcerer, I think she could kill them right now. I guess maybe not, it's three on one. I'm looking, monster manual, CR 13. Dragon. Oh yeah, Shadow Dragon. Yep. Young Red Shadow Dragon. Cool. That's pretty cool. Again, I've also got my ranger who owes this hag a favor, but we'll see how that goes. There's also... <laughs> There's also, and I don't know how this is going to work, but I, this is a, something I established a long time ago. Within the scaled wetlands, there's an ancient green dragon who's also disguised as a dragonborn. And... She's involved in the area, so I don't know what she's doing at the moment. Or he, what he's doing at the moment. Twilight, or er, sorry, that's so cool, especially with the whole Twilight thing Dimros has. Whoa, sorry, is it Carfax? Carfax is evil. Why not use the favor to pull storyline if you need to? I was thinking about that Hawaiian guy. I was also thinking about that in a way where if I go the route where um, my ranger, or where, where I give Yondor the magical item, which ends up being a summoning key or a key to something or a, an item of whatever, the person that comes to them and is like, hey, I've been looking for these and I need you to give them to me, could be the hag that they've met. That could be the hag, and the favor she calls could be for them to go find the other ones. And he's magically bound to do whatever she asks. So, I thought, I did think about that. As like a quick aside. But, I, it's not a plan that I have yet. There's so many ways this could go. This campaign could go so many different ways, especially considering they met a Nightwalker and didn't f do anything about it. And they were uh, both of both of our uh, two of my people were like, um, we need to do something about that Nightwalker. Eventually, we need to go back and deal with it. So that's another thing they could go do. It's also the ancient red dragon that they released on the world, same as the stream game. There's a lot going on in this. There's a lot going on in this world currently. <laughs> that I can I could pull so many different ways if I need it. But I think that is about it for now. What is... Oh. 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 Cartillifax. Oh. I thought you literally meant Carfax, the website. Oh. No, it's not that. We released an ancient dragon? Ah. Well, you didn't, but the Charlotte, Charlotte Ogre and Crow released a... Um, yeah, an ancient red dragon at one point. Nope, Carfax. So yeah, that was good. This was a lot of good stuff. This has helped me consolidate what I want to do with the campaign tomorrow. And a lot of what I want to do with it going forward. So this this was good. This was a good, uh, a good chit-chat. Again, this is what I was going to do tonight anyway. I This is what I was going to do with my night anyway. So this was good to do on stream. 
I wish I had D. I wish D and D Beyond would have let me log in, but oh well. Why? Why? What? Favorite monster ever is a dragon turtle. Too bad I missed it. Swirl. Ugh. Oh, they walked into a portal. Um, and the portal took them into a dragon's lair, and then the dragon chased them out through the portal. I mean, they didn't do it on purpose. They just annoyed the dragon. Uh I'm happy with it though. I'm happy where we're, where we're going with this. And then I've got three different campaigns happening in this world at the same time, which is all, which is exactly really what I wanted. I wanted to use this world. I spent so much time making it. I wanted to use it, so I'm happy. I just got to keep differentiating between what's happening in each campaign so I don't get confused. <laughs> Actually, no, that's not true. I have four campaigns going in this world. Yikes! All right. So, yeah, guys, that's going to be it. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening. For uh, Thanks for coming and hanging out. I This was a lot of me talking at you. So, yeah. Appreciate you guys listening. Peter's right, it is your bedtime. What you mean? It's 2 a.m., man. I gotta go to bed. 2 a.m. is my bedtime. This is fun. Should do this more often. I'm... I'm, de I'm debating. Hawaiian guy. I'm debating if I want to do more of these, like, come talk out loud things. The reason I actually haven't done one before this is because... Uh, stream campaign. The one I was thinking about doing, and, and the one I spent a lot of time doing, is the stream campaign. So... I can't really talk about that on stream because people on stream. Take it away, Gabe. I'm listening. Yo, Zach, thank you for the beep beep. I'm a sheep. Thank you uh, so so much. Thank you for the thungar. Doesn't Peters take place in your world? Uh, at the moment, yes. That's that's the plan. Um, his is right. His is down here. His takes place in the Southern Isles down here. It's here. Guys, thank you so much for watching this. Uh, again, possibly in the future we'll do more of this. It will have to be non-stream campaign games, obviously, but I have some I have several of those now, so I don't feel so bad about talking about them. Um, Hope you guys have a wonderful night wherever you are, or morning or afternoon. But yeah, I'll see you guys Friday. Or, yeah, I'll see you guys Friday. Toodles, everybody. <laughs>